Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, we are continuing to bring in some really exciting guests for you. Uh, today, it's David Linthicum, the SVP of Cloud Tech Partners, uh, now a fully owned subsidiary of HP. Um, welcome to the show, David. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited because I've been listening to your podcasts, um, reading your material for a long time, and, and I get to turn the tables on somebody who uh, normally is asking deep, insightful questions, so the pressure's on for me to do it. Um, what's it like to be on the other side of the, the microphone for a minute? I, I love it, actually, because I, I, I was always thinking about doing Dave Lenticum's narcissistic podcast, where I just <laughs> guess and they interview me. Versus me yeah, talking about topics that they want to do, and I'll just completely gloat on my own knowledge and get very impressed with myself. Podcast. I'm the only listener, but I think that's okay. Uh, since I'm <laughs> uh, oh, that um, that's making me think of a uh, Twenty One Pilots song about um, candles and scents, but that's funny. Um, the it's funny because with, with your show, uh, sometimes I'm listening to it and I'm, I'm shouting at the podcaster. You're one of, you're one of those podcasters um, because you, you, know, you, you set up your guests, they, they get to talk for a while. Do you ever feel like you, you, know, you want to stop somebody and say, wait, I disagree? What, what's your protocol? I, I typically don't on this podcast. I mean, the one I did for InfoWorld for years, um, both on SOA and also cloud computing, uh, I did because it was a little bit, it was only 10 minutes long and it was edited down uh, very good. And, and I'm, the people wanted, you know, you know, kind of confrontation. But, you know, the problem is, is you, if you're trying to get good guests and knowledgeable guests, they typically don't like confrontation. And so it's okay to have a very civil conversation. And even if they say things I don't agree, I, I will politely push back, but I won't, uh, you know, uh, basically a la, you know, hard hitting uh, or basically attack journalism, you know, start, start arguing with them back and forth. And, you know, it's funny, like even the private cloud versus public cloud debate that we had with Bernard Golden and the, and John Engates of, of Rackspace, which I thought would be probably the most contestuous podcast we had. It, it turned out being a HUD fest, and so uh, I, I just kind of, and I think we're, we're, we're a little too nice out there and a little bit uh, unwilling to push back on, on things that we disagree with, and I think it's okay to be polite, and you can be, you know, disagreeable. Uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable, and, and, and that's probably something that's missing from our industry. You know, we have a tendency to kind of accept things that are not necessarily something we believe. And, and I've, I've, I've quit doing that for a larger part, and it's gotten me in some, some hot water, but it's the way I do business. Makes sense to me. I, I think we, it's easy to not acknowledge that there's multiple right ways to solve IT problems. Um, and that typically sets us up for a who's going to win, you know, A versus, versus B. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get into some of those, those types of questions. There's, there's places where it's useful, and there's places where it's just destructive. Um, the chef versus puppet days were a classic one to me for that. Um, you had mentioned the Bernard Golden podcast um, that you just did. Uh, I was listening to that one. The, towards the end of it, you really hit on a subject about the lack of skill sets. Um, you know, I would I would love to hear your take since you were you know <laughs> Bernard was running. You know, what's what's the what are we going to do in in IT to solve these these skill set gaps? Well, people have to get, people ultimately uh, fix it themselves. So as the salaries go up and the demand goes up in the cloud space and the AWS engineer space, the open stack engineer space, people eventually get on the job, job training or they get the training and get the jobs via the training, those sorts of things. That latency t usually takes about two years. So we're running into the typical technology lag where the technology desires are here in terms of moving into cloud. And that kind of showed up in the last couple of years, the demand has spiked. And therefore everybody and anybody is looking for people with cloud computing skills, you know, Amazon skills specific to uh, particular kinds of technologies, Kubernetes and containers, things like that. And, and there's a huge gap. I mean, I, we're out there as a consulting firm, you know, trying to find the best and the brightest and, you know, also people who are willing to do consulting. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do. And the enterprises are out there doing the same thing. I mean, it's not a day, I don't have a day that goes by where I don't get a call or an email or a LinkedIn, you know, message from some recruiter you know, that's trying, is, you know, desperately trying to fill a job. And so the, what I think now is we're in a crisis because we have about uh, five unfilled positions that are chasing one candidate. 
And that obviously that can't scale and it will correct itself over some time, but it's going to take a while for it to happen. Well, we're going to be at a point where we're dealing with um, people who are unqualified, uh, who are hired to do the job simply because they need a heart, someone with a heartbeat and to, to hold that position and start moving things forward as best they can. And that's going to cause some failure. And also we're going to see projects that are stifled and unable to move forward because they can't find the people and the talent to do it. So, and that makes me think back to the Y2K days where, right, anybody who, who could know, knew the top from the bottom of a keyboard was being hired to program and remediate. Uh, it was, it was, we were truly desperate times at, at that juncture. But it, is there, you know, the, the logical place that goes, though, is that people just make stuff up, right? This is, to me, I'm, I'm, everything you're describing sounds like, an accumulation of technical debt, right? Somebody who doesn't know what they're doing coming in and saying, okay, I'll just hack my way through this. They don't know patterns and practices. What do you tell companies when they're, when they're in this desperate situation and they're like, oh, I'm just going to take the expedient path. Um, you know, how did, how do you get them to pull back from that? I, I can't get the work done today. I don't have time to do it right. Sort of thinking what's, what's the, what's, is there a solution? Well, number one, money solves all problems. And so if you look at an absorbent salary or, you know, hire consultants that do know, know, know what they're doing, you know, like people at my firm, um, obviously you know the price. And, uh, and I think that's the thing right now. Um, not that we ever charge people, but the thing is, if, the, if they're looking to hire people, which a lot of it are because they want the talent uh, owned by the company and employee of the company, uh, then they're going to have to overpay for those positions to get the talent that they need. If they under hire and basically hire people who are, you know, misrepresenting their skills and things like that, which is a possibility because you don't have a lot of cloud people in the cloud expertise in the enterprises data that those people, um, that has a tendency to be worse. Um, I don't know how many problems that I've come into with the, the client companies, you know, that were caused by people, you know, building these cloud-based systems who didn't know what they were doing. And ultimately, they went off, you know, went off course, you know, to the tune of $10 million and, of course, lost a year. And they have to back up and kind of hit the reset button. And I understand why they did it, because they felt like they were missing the cloud computing party. Uh, they couldn't hire or, or, or pay for the expertise that they needed or use the consultants that they needed. And so they yeah. just ended up making mistakes. And that's just going to be something we're going to have to deal with over the next five years. And hopefully, it'll be few and far between. But, but I do see more of it coming down the line and, you know, talking with people and, you know, dealing with architects and some of the enterprises and government agencies that I'm talking to, you know, kind of informally out there, you know, I can see them going off in the wrong direction. And, and you really can't convince them of that because you kind of have to, you know, let them touch the hot stove. Um, yeah. Eventually I hear from them when they're here too and they're looking to get <laughs> So what does is, what is the wrong direction smell like as it's burning on the stove? What's, what's that? How does somebody know they're going in the wrong direction? Well, they don't know. That's why they're, that's why they're heading it. If they did, they knew. I hopefully they correct it. But you know, things like keeping they want to keep the data local on their on their uh, within their enterprise and use the uh, public cloud to process information and don't understand the latency stuff and you know even with lease lines and you know, even outages and things like that and dealing with um, performance and uh, uptime and uh, you know latency issues and, and and then security is the big one. Uh, so I see people. Mm -hmm that security will kind of be taken care of for, you know, they can do, do something after the fact, but it has to be systemic to everything they do. They're not using proper encryption, they're not using proper governance, they're not using proper security uh, policies and tools, they're not using identity management, uh, you know, kinds of approaches and technology that exists in the cloud, I think it's, it's there for them to use, they're just not using it. And also people who are just making things way too complex, and mixing, you know, three brands of uh, private cloud and three band brands of public cloud and think that this is great, we're building a multi-cloud, but the reality is they're building just a complex architecture that's not gonna have the capabilities that they need if they need to change it because of the amount of work that has to be done because they don't have automation, they don't have DevOps, they don't have a lot of things that are built into it. And you kind of see these right away. You, know, you, get to be, you get to have a mentality of a doctor that's been you know, practicing for 50 years where you can you know, spot you know, certain problems and health issues, you know, almost immediately. And when I get into these organizations, a few questions, I kind of get right down to, you know, where things are going right, but also where things are going wrong. And 
or they're going to make a lot of mistakes. And in many instances, they're willing to listen um, to suggestions. In other instances, they're already off in that direction, so they don't want to hear any suggestions that are going to go away from the <laughs> room. <laughs> so that's that's the hard medicine thing. It's it's hey wait you know maybe you need to put the deadline your deadlines on hold. Um, I've seen this in I you know I've been you and I both have been in IT long enough to to know this that um, I'm going for the smells again but that 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 stink of a project that uh, pushing on it harder is going to make it slower. Um, the mythical man month problem um, and it's some yeah. They have a right to fail. I mean, they uh, they can disagree with me, and they can, can continue on until failure, or maybe not. Maybe you know, things things will, they'll get lucky, but uh, I think people have the right to to run things into a wall, and I don't think they will get in their way when they do it. So you you had mentioned DevOps and automation. It's a topic near and dear to to my heart, um, and there's an element of you know um, there's a whole bunch of analogies people use here: yak shaving or bike shedding. Um, where you're, you're, you've got to build infrastructure and, and process and automation before that'll speed up your project once it's done, right? Sharpening the saw, we use all these great analogies. Um, when you look at this and you look at a project that's challenged or late um, or that hasn't budgeted for that, how do you how do you come back and say, hey, look, you need to, to do it. You need to, you need to make these investments because it'll help you in the end. Um, and, and are there tools or processes that you recommend for that? Yeah, most enterprises are kind of hip to that as to the fact they need to change the way in which they're doing automation and management, application development, and, and are implementing DevOps. I mean, we have a DevOps organization at Cloud Technology Partners, which works on most of the projects that we're on. So for migrating into cloud, they're also you know migrating to DevOps and putting the tool sets together and making the investments that can happen. The concern with with clients that aren't doing that, and that's a that's a small minority, um, you know, would be budgetary things. Typically, they 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 can pay for the move to the cloud, but they can't pay for the transformation of the DevOps. And so, you're going to have all these workloads that exist in the public cloud that necessarily you don't have the automation to really maintain the software and continuously improve, continuously integrate, continuously test, and all the things that uh, you know we should be doing right now in a modern development uh, organization. And then my guidance to them is I can sit down and work a business model for you. You can take your directors that shows you how this is something that's going to pay for itself. And, you know, basically, you know, start moving in this direction. And it's going to, it's going to uh, reap rewards within the first year that it's out. And so, that's in the sense then when it comes down to money. Right. So your, your approach is let's not worry about the tools, let's worry about the business justification. Put, put a CI, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline in place from a business perspective. Yeah, I mean, because you are you talk about, you know, uh, tool sets, specifically DevOps tool sets to executives, their eyes are going to roll back in their heads. I mean, all they really think about is EPC to share and returning, yeah. you know, equity to stockholders. And I've been a CEO before and, and you know, see an officer of a publicly traded company, so I understand that. Uh, so you have to kind of speak in a different language. And then you talk to the people who are doing the tactical implementation about, you know, stepwise, you know, the 30 steps they need to go through and picking the right tools, setting up the right automation, uh, doing the continuous testing, getting the, the workloads and pipeline set up, getting the security set up, and all the tactical stuff it takes to make the stuff happen. And so it's it's two different, very different conversations. But you can have the executive conversation first because you don't get money if you don't have that. And you know, as I tell them all the time, no bucks, no buck Rogers. <laughs> nice phrase. I like that. Do you do you distinguish between continuous integration and continuous deployment from that perspective? Yeah, I do. I mean, continuous deployment is basically moving. I mean, it's continuous everything. Everybody seems to put continuous in front of, you know, uh, star uh, these days. But continuous deployment would be getting into staging and then moving from staging into production. And, and the ability to kind of do that in a very smooth way that can be uh, undone at any time, even undone automatically uh, through automation. And then continuous integration is bringing everything together into one unit that includes testing and includes, you know, and the testing includes unit, component, security. And it's really customized what the organization is about, the languages that they use, the data that they use, things like that. I mean, people always ask me, 
you know, and I, I write a lot of articles on DevOps and a lot of detailed mm -hmm. articles too. And they always ask me about what specifically the DevOps change should be. And it really is dependent on the organization, the technology, the enabling databases you have, the enabling languages and things like that to have. And then once that, you can do the continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, you know, build, uh, and, you know, continuous improvement, continuous design, continuous development, uh, and then automate the, the crap out of everything so that it's a very easy to use kind of work, uh, workflow. And then therefore you have the ability to change, which is what we're going for. It's not the ability to build an application one time. It's the ability to build an application 20 times a month and do so in a way where the application that's always going to improve and having the tools and technology around to do that. So is there any case you can think of where it's not appropriate to be putting yourself into a CICD type infrastructure? Yeah, I, I can see organizations, um, and I talk to a few of them all the time. I mean, I, I talked to a rubber plant one time and okay. uh, looking to modernize uh, basically a process that hasn't been modernized in the last hundred years. And so um, while we could certainly move their workloads in the cloud and certainly, you know, do some basic, you know, tweaks to their development environment, they didn't have the talent on board, the development uh, capabilities. They weren't willing to hire DevOps engineers. They weren't willing to make basically make the investment. And the thing is, I'd agree with them because the investment didn't need to be made in their particular case because their environment and their enterprise, their architecture was so simplistic that would actually probably cause things to get worse. And so I recommended that they stay on the current course um, and Godspeed in the way they went. And, and that's because I think if we, you know, try to force feed technology, which we do all the time as technologists, in this particular instances, it would be contraindicated for that business. And I think you have to kind of realize that many times, the cloud's not right for all workloads, DevOps not right for all workloads. Um, and it's certainly right for most things, certainly right for very complex environments and big, you know, complex uh, development processes, but it's not right each and every time. Right. That makes, that makes sense. That, that's a, an interesting take because it's a, it's a challenge because you might just have let someone be listening and say, no, nah, I'm off the hook for needing this DevOps stuff. Um, but I think your answer is basically, look, if you're not planning to keep up, fine, don't worry, don't, you know, don't. Don't don't force fit it, but uh, if you're actively developing, I'd be hard pressed to find somebody who shouldn't uh, push the pause, fix their deployment pipelines, uh, and get things get things going right. Um, yeah, there's there's always stuff to be fixed and improved. Um, it's right. just you have to make the cost justification and the ROI uh, justification to get the money to right. make it happen. That's where you kind of run into reality. So you, you said something in here that I wanted to push back on a little bit or, or, or nuance in, in discussion um, because DevOps and CICD pipelines are often cloud processes, but the word cloud is getting incredibly muddy right now. Um, and we've got containers coming in like crazy. People are talking about that. We've got cloud being often seen as equivalent to virtual machines. Um, we've got physical infrastructure that we're starting to automate um, in very cloud-like ways so that, you know, you can create, you know, we have bare metal hosting. Oracle's um, been out there with this. IBM's been trying to do it for a long time. Packet.net doing physical. Are there really differences? What, what should people be paying attention to in this spectrum? Well, I think that cloud basically is another platform to consider, and, and uh, you should consider your existing legacy platforms and private cloud and, and then public cloud, you know, capabilities of doing that. The, the public cloud has a tendency to be more cost effective, and they're also improving upon their stuff more uh, quickly than the stuff that exists on premise. And so I don't really get in there with kind of the cloud religion and you know say cloud a hundred times in the same presentation. I think that's ineffective. And we're looking for ultimately <laughs> the, the most effective target platform that's going to be right for the particular workloads that are out there. And we always consider the on-premise and you know, what I call modern on-premise, which is private clouds, pragmatic hybrid clouds, multi-cloud, you know, all those sorts of things. And really kind of the architecture is typically map in that direction. So if you're building a, you know, a DevOps environment, um, it's obviously easier to keep everything in the cloud, but as I found in actually doing this stuff in real life, that um, not everything lives in the cloud that you need, and you have to usually have a mix of on-premise and cloud-based tools to you know, kind of get ultimately where you need to go. 
where people like a tenant will want to, you know, leverage the you know, Microsoft stack or the AWS stack and Google has a stack they'll eventually, you know, want to do that. But ultimately it's really about getting into things that are going to be much more complex and convoluted than people understand. And it's going to be a mix of different technologies. Right. So, uh, and I'm thinking about Mike Tavis and I've, you've talked about some of these things. How do people pick, right? You're talking about hybrid and multi-cloud. There's a huge menu of choices. And I know one of the things I, I respect a lot about cloud technology partners practice is that you are not particularly opinionated towards, you know, force fitting everybody into one, one cloud infrastructure. I know you have practices for all of the clouds. Um, and I've had healthy, healthy discussions <laughs> with people you know, there about how you make that choice, what you recommend for customers. Can, can you give us some insight on, on what, what would be a dialogue for that from a customer perspective with, with you? Yeah, it would be, we're going to look at your workloads and, you know, and see which one should move to work, which cloud, uh, because they're more cost effective or going to be more effective and efficient in running on the particular cloud. So, and that's obviously not what they want to hear. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. they want to hear AWS or they want to hear Google or they want to hear, you know, who's the best cloud out there because we'll move there. And that's not necessarily the answer. So, you know, say a typical enterprise, and, and Mike knows this too, because he's, he's on the ground at lots of different projects. A typical enterprise may have 5,000 workloads. And out of those 5,000, we can kind of eliminate 30% uh, on the average that are not going to be good fits for cloud. We can move them right. to Polo and we can move them to MSPs and have other alternatives. But, you know, we shouldn't, you know, try to force fit this thing on an Amazon cloud or a Google cloud or a Microsoft cloud. And then we look at those, uh, the remainder of those applications and do a triage uh, in terms of what should happen to them. Should they be re-hosted, refactored, which means rewriting pieces of them, major refactor, light refactor, how they tightly coupled to the database, what about security issues, compliance issues, and lots of boring stuff, you know, to a checklist that probably goes, you know, as big as a book, you know, kind of comes into play as we look at each one of these workloads, each one of these applications. But as we do that, <clears throat> we know that if it's a, you know, lamp-based, uh, you know, lamp-based app that is probably going to be li live better on AWS, even though we have to scan the code and val validate that. If it's a Microsoft app, it's probably going to live better on Azure. Uh, if it's an intensive um, data, <clears throat> data predictive app or a MI-based app, it could live better on Google. And we have to go through there and basically answer those questions for each one of the workloads. And once we do that, then we go back to the client and we say, these are best fit here, these are a best fit here, these are a best fit here. So we're moving into a heterogeneous environment that comes with its own set of costs and risks because we have to get the different skill sets around. And then we have to kind of make decisions on is it you know, worth the risk of opening up this other you know, public cloud front uh, and then having the skill sets around to make this happen if we're uh, able to you know, move the applications more effectively and efficiently. See, it's those kind of decisions which really, you know, kind of end up being made. And you do make trade-offs. You know, maybe I, I don't want to use Google because I don't want to have the Google skill sets around because uh, we already have Microsoft and AWS and therefore I'm going to run the data on AWS and Redshift. And, and we make those trade-offs all the time. And, and that's a major, major, major project. You know, hundreds of people are involved, millions and millions of dollars. And Ultimately, that's the way you, you pick the target clouds you're going for. And, and by the way, you never discount anything on premise, MSP, uh, my iPhone, you know, everything becomes kind of a target cloud. <laughs> well, it, this is one of the things I, I, that you're saying that, that I've come to agree with very strongly um, is that hybrid is not the idea that we're going to pick up workloads and ship them magically, follow the sun for different providers, and create a brokerage where it's totally agnostic. What you're actually describing is a best of breed. I, I'm going to leverage, you know, the, the the menu of choices I have. I'm going to pick the things that make sense for me. I might make some sub hard decisions in order to consolidate my workloads. But at the end of the day, we're in a in a world of incredible heterogeneity um, right now. And and it sounds like I mean you're you're saying cope with it, we'll help you make good choices, but that's, that's life, right? There's no single vendor that has, that, that's basically the only choice. Yeah, the life would be easy if we could just, you know, pick Amazon or pick Microsoft and then keep the same skill sets around. But 
the reality is the, the inefficiency in terms of operations uh, that would cause for our clients to be, um, you know, way head and shoulders above any kind of benefit they get from moving into the cloud. So we're trying to make things effective as much as possible. We can save them 50% in operational expenses, which is hard to do, but also provide them with the agility to make the changes they need to their infrastructure, their architecture, their applications, DevOps, and you know, leverage of services and configurables and automations and things like that, uh, then they're not going to get the benefit of cloud. So both of those cylinders have to be firing uh, in order to you know, find cloud effective. And ultimately, you have to map it into a very complex architecture because it has to be customized to their particular needs. So uh, you, you just said something very profound. Um, I hope <laughs> we're 20 minutes in. I, I love that the you get to the profound, the profound nuggets, right? Uh, agility, automation drives agility. Agility is the, the thing that you're trying to achieve with these decisions, um, right? You need fit and agility. It's a, it's a, it's a two edge, two, two sides of the coin. Um, and they're both, they're both important uh, to consider. Um, that segues us into a, another topic that people are um, very excited about to create portability and reduce lock-in, which is containers. Um, are containers the silver bullet for this? Do they, do they free up um, you know, mobility and flexibility the way, that, the way that people think? No, not really. I mean, containers are a great paradigm, and we've been you know, uh, dealing with these sorts of things for years. I'm old, so we, I remember distributed objects and, and, and J2E containers, and then, you know, the, here, the, here comes along another instance of that. And I do think that they're indicated for lots of different applications that may need to have portability or may need to have some distributed capabilities uh, in between uh, various types of uh, cloud-based systems, even non-cloud-based systems. Um, so for, in that way, they're pretty impressive because I can write, once and run anywhere. We've done that within a number of clients, and I'm just really impressed with the way that they come out. And and containers is a standard, of, and, and Docker is a standard, and uh, Kubernetes and all these other things that are that are there are workable and able to do. But you have to pick the right application to containerize, or you have to pick the right net new application to write containers because it's going to cost you more money and time to go ahead and create these containers. So there needs to be like we just talked about. In this case. So I kind of look at containers as a platform under themselves, even though it's a platform that moves between platforms and huh, you can, you know, you can cluster them and you can make them scale with Kubernetes or Mesos or other kinds of uh, you know, orchestration tools out there. And for that, they're extremely helpful. But I don't believe in kind of uh, willy nilly throwing containers at every one of the problems out there. And that's kind of a sensitive topic because when I go in, there's such a fervent, under, you know, wanting containers and now serverless, which has also kind of popped up and we're seeing that, you know, that it, it's a, I, I don't want to let anybody down, but I do have to walk through the existing application and it is going to take some, uh, um, you know, convincing that their, you know, ISAM COBOL application was written 30 years ago should not live in a container or SAP should not live in a container. You know, even though you may, you can do it, um, that doesn't mean necessarily you should, and you're not going to get the value out of doing that. And also, portability seems to be something that people always assume is going to be there, but um, in many instances, these containers, I'd say most instances, once they're written and localized on a particular platform, they're not moving. Um, and they're usually bound to a particular, uh, you know, external resource outside the container, which means that they're in essence bound to the platform that they're on. So I'm seeing those kind of architectures that are, you know, also kind of, you know, flying in the face of the benefits of the container. So if portability is not there if you're uh, not necessarily doing distributed applications. Uh, if it's not net new, um, which means you're going to have to do a lot of rewriting. Uh, you should look at containers as an opportunity, but it's never, it's not going to be a fit agent every time. Would, would you encourage somebody to steer clear of serverless in favor of containers if they could get similar capability? Or out of, out of fears for lock-in or being too embedded, say, into Lambda uh, versus, um, you know, if I wrote it in a container, I'd be able to at least not be uh, quite as trapped? Is that a concern? I think it would be a concern. I think they're very different technologies and what they do. Um, serverless kind of just the you know benefit you know calling it serverless, even though you have to use servers, will actually 
you know, allocate the resources on your behalf. And you know, one of the pains in the neck of, of doing development in the cloud is that we have to configure a platform that's going to run our applications and have to do so correctly and have to guess the amount of memory. And this is something I always get wrong memory and storage and things like that. And there's calculators to do it. And it just becomes a very manual process. And by the way, if you redo that as you start to scale and then serverless kind of removes you from that and platforms and services has actually done that for years, but now we have it, the capabilities in the IS systems with uh, Lambda and also function on the Microsoft side. I think Google has some stuff as well. So if we're trying to remove the developers from having to deal with infrastructure issues and abstracting them from, from the infrastructure, um, mm -hmm serverless is going to be the way that you go and so so it's going to be net new applications that necessarily are not net hard to determine in terms of the resources you need you're able to you know kind of build them in kind of the proprietary fences that they have around those particular products and that's where it's going to be cost justifiable uh, containers are more open uh, typically, I mean, obviously they're, they're dealing with particular standards and, you know, some people, you know, laugh at me when I call the Docker standard open or the Kubernetes standard open, but you can, you have more vendors in there, you have more players in there, you're not necessarily dealing with AWS and Microsoft or Google, and therefore you have some more flexibility in how you build them. And so while I do see containers being part of DevOps infrastructures and sometimes serverless stuff, more of the serverless stuff is around net new stuff that, you know, needs to have this built-in automagical scaling today. Uh, containers end up being more containerized of existing application, no real-world problems, things like that we're solving. But then again, we're, you know, a year or two in serverless and, you know, four years into containers and who knows, you know, what we're going to see in the next year or so in terms of how this technology progresses. And I may have a different opinion if we're talking. It, it's interesting. Our, I mean, we're using... Uh the Amazon stack internally at RackN uh, for our SaaS backend, right? It's Lambda, it's API Gateway, it's DynamoDB, it's Cognito, right? Which are all of these very, you know, very hardwired into Amazon, completely non-portable from that perspective. Um, and not part of an easy continuous deployment pipeline. There's sort of pieces and parts there, but wiring all those things together is a, is a task left for the reader. Um, and, you know, to me, compared to a CI pipeline that produces containers and sort of puts them through a regular development pipeline, um, the, the Kubernetes, it's not, it's not Kubernetes specific, it's the, the immutable container creation process or image creation process if you're doing with VMs or physical, um, seems more digestible for most teams than trying to piece it together out of, out of the cloud offerings right now. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think you're, you're in a good use case for, you know, the reasons that they would go that particular way. Um, yeah. Some enterprises, you may have a uh, religious belief around the other technology, and yet you kind of have to get behind that, and sometimes you don't. You just build it the technology they want it built in, and uh, others kind of move from the requirements into the technology. I suspect you'd end up at the same place if you did that. Do you have uh, an opinion on the Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, uh, uh, Nomad, yeah, uh, no. uh, evolution. Yeah, I mean Kubernetes one. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean the the thing is, and you can certainly use Docker Swarm in some instances uh, if you're, you know, all in Docker, uh, and that's not a bad product. Um, and Mesos, uh, I think they had a. Uh, scalability advantage a year ago, but I think that's kind of gone by the wayside now that we have the next generation of Kubernetes. But the, the thing is, is so many companies with big budgets and R&D budgets are into Kubernetes now as a core engine. And I think Amazon actually just moved over, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard that. They definitely joined the CNCF. I mean, I, I'm watching the Pivotal, um, the um, European Pivotal Conference um, which is basically becoming a Kubernetes conference and they're changing their names to be more agnostic. And um, I was just at HashiConf, very similar, a lot of Kubernetes uh, enthusiasm. I'm going to OpenStack, which is a Kubernetes festival effectively at this point. Um, I agree with your, your, your statement on that. Um, yeah, at the same time, I, Kubernetes has a lot of gaps too, so. Well, there always is, um, and just like you know everything else, in, the, in, in terms of it being a standard, 
um, you know, instead of Google kind of looking at it as a proprietary thing, that's just going to be an inefficient way of growing the technology. We saw that with OpenStack, and we'll see it with OpenStack and some of the other, even with Mesos. Um, so, but eventually, if there's enough money and need behind it, a lot of those gaps will be filled. But, you know, we're seeing Kubernetes on every one of our container, you know, installs, you know, one to one. Uh, I don't know anybody who's running containers unless they're doing just playing around with stuff that's not doing it, that running them on Kubernetes infrastructure orchestration as well. That makes a ton of sense to me. I, I'm seeing the same thing. It's that's what that's what people are asking. Mesos is still out there, but um, but uh, even Mesos and Mesosphere is embracing Kubernetes as the container scheduling component. Um, and that's and I, so that's it, it's amazing how fast those dominoes sort of tipped over towards uh, Kubernetes as a as a as a dominant platform from that perspective. I think I declared Kubernetes the winner two years ago and. <laughs> so now you get to sit back and watch. It's fun to have, fun to, fun to be on the, the right side of the prediction scale. Yeah, the, jo the joke is at Cloud Technology Partners is that I'm always right, and I'm actually not, um, but uh, that's the joke. Uh, nice. No pressure. So, so with that, we're almost done. Any, any predictions uh, for us on, on, on leading trends that you want to you you try to pre-declare a couple more winners? Absolutely. The, the big leading topic of, uh, of AWS reInvent, which I refuse to go to until the last week, uh, will be uh, deep learning. And that'll be at the Google conference and also the Microsoft conference as well. The Microsoft and IBM already have a deep learning solution. Uh, but I think that's going to be a very important thing coming up, and they're going to find it in all aspects of the cloud-based system, including security and governance and orchestration and managing containers and you know, API-based systems. So machine learning to do the tactical things you need to do around artificial intelligence and then deep learning about discerning key patterns from massive amounts of data. And so we're moving in from the infrastructure stuff, which we're kind of getting solved right now, to the security stuff, which are kind of getting solved right now, into making these damn things think for a change. That's a good, that's a good bet. I like that one. What about Edge? Where do you see Edge going? It's also important, but you know, obviously, it's it's important for everybody who builds hardware because they kind of see. Uh, <laughs> okay, fair enough. In terms of uh, you know, just like hybrid cloud, you see the same thing, and I kind of understand doing that redemption in terms of you know, be able to sell more hardware. And so Cisco's all over the cloud computing stuff and things like that. But it is important, ultimately, if you're building these IoT-based systems, and it more is IoT-related, you're going to have to put some of the processing and some of the data storage. You know, out on the edge, you know, nearest to the devices or the sensors, even within the sensors. And I knew this, you know, when I was doing rocket sounding, you know, real-time data acquisition work, you know, back in the 80s for NASA, and we had to do the same thing. So we're just finding this out as we're getting IoT deeper into the processing, realize we can't transmit everything back to a centralized cloud because of the latency issue and the ability to kind of do it um, at the edge and then use the cloud kind of as the master controller is going to be a much more effective architecture. Um, and if you Google away, I wrote an IEEE model for edge computing and, you know, kind of how to, you know, think about it and kind of back it in there, um, you know, based on some stuff we did at uh, Cloud Technology Partners. And I think it's, uh, it, it's kind of coming into its own right now. I, I feel like I have another hour of questions. Um, I, I do, we, we, we do need to wrap it up. Um, Boy, there's, I, you know, I want to get, I want to get a list of, of where people can find you. Um, before I do that, um, HP acquisition, you have a small note on that. That's, that's the big news for cloud technology partners. And then if you want to just outro to how people can find you and, and get in touch with you, that'd be great. Yeah, Cloud Technology Partners got acquired by HPE, which is a good thing. Uh, HPE got a bunch of very, very, very smart people. Um, to uh, assist uh, the HP customers uh, in getting into the cloud. Um, so I won't be going moving forward with the acquisition, so I'll be leaving cloud technology partners at the end of the month uh, onto, onto other things, but uh, looking forward to seeing how that whole thing evolves and, and really wish everybody luck. Um, the uh, uh, Finding me, you can always reach me at uh, my uh, LinkedIn page, um, David Linthicum, L-I-N-T-H-I-C-U-M, uh, Twitter, David, uh, David Linthicum, L-I-N-T-H-I-C-U-M, all one word, uh, and just Google away. I, mean, I do the 
blog on InfoWorld. I do a blog on Tech Target. Uh, I write the uh, column, uh, write a cloud column for IEEE. Um, uh, we'll see what we're going to do with the podcast now that HP's bought it. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be out. I'm doing a lot of speaking this fall. I'll be at a Cloud Expo. I'll be speaking in AI World. I'm speaking next week at App Dynamics, um, and I have 18 courses on lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. Check those out, including a lots on uh, advanced uh, cloud architectures, which uh, you won't find a lot of content out there. How's that for Dave's Narcissistic Podcast? That's amazing. I, so, you know, we just, this is tip of the iceberg stuff, so you can, anybody listening, go deep on what Dave is talking about. It's amazing pieces. He, he loves to bring in uh, controversial topics. He's not shy about hard topics. I didn't realize you weren't making the transition to HP. I think that that's a boon for people who want speakers and consultants and top level thinking uh, that's independent of, of a vendor. And um, I'm interested to see what your next play is going to be. So I really appreciate the time today. Thank you. you got it.